Hi, and welcome back to the Apology Podcast. I'm Jesse Pearson, the founder and editor of Apology Magazine. This episode's guest is the songwriter, musician, writer, and artist Bill Callahan. His latest album, Gold Record, was released in September. Uh, It's his 18th LP, and it's great, as all of them have been. Bill recorded under the name Smog for the first 15-ish years of his career, and then since 2007, he releases his music under his given and his surname. Uh, You can go back as far as his first release, Sewn to the Sky, and you can trace a really fascinating and beautiful progression through all of his albums. I won't presume to tell you how to take that trip, but if you haven't, you should. And if you have, but you haven't for a while, you should do it again. Uh, In addition to his music... Bill has very sporadically written prose. His epistolary novelette called Letters to Emma Bolcut was published by his record label Drag City in 2010. And in uh, 2013, I was lucky to publish a short story by Bill in the first issue of Apology. You can also get a book of his collected lyrics called I Drive a Valence, which uh, contains some really nicely matched ink drawings by Bill, too. What else do I want to tell you? Well, Bill and Will Oldham, another former guest of this podcast, have been doing a great project since October where they collaborate and then release a cover song each week. They've done stuff by all kinds of people. um, David Berman, Steely Dan, Cat Stevens. And then each song features a third collaborator, and those have included people like uh, Azita Youssefi, Matt Sweeney, another former Apology Podcast guest. David Pajo, another former Apology podcast guest. Okay, that's getting obnoxious. Um, Also, Cassie Berman, Sir Richard Bishop of Sun City Girls, uh, Ty Siegel. There are around 20 of these, and you can find them uh, all on Bandcamp. Also, here is my now customary caveat regarding audio recorded remotely during a pandemic. This episode has two segments. The first, the longer one, sounds pretty great if you ask me. The second, shorter one, uh, we had microphone and internet connectivity troubles, so it doesn't sound as good. Uh, The first part might spoil you a little bit, but stick with it. There are treasures in the second bit, too. Also, after the interview, I will uh, read you some follow-up thoughts that Bill emailed me. So, yes, um, please welcome Bill Callahan to the Apology Podcast. So, what are you reading right now? Um, right now, um, my reading is, is kind of a mess because, um, I think I used to buy, before the pandemic, I used to buy one book at a time, kind of, and read it, or maybe two, and, um, uh, since I've been trying to, you know, keep, there's this, a uh, local, Texas bookstore uh, called Book People that I think is the oldest and uh, biggest independent bookstore in Texas. And uh, they started sending me all these emails about, like, you know, help keep us in business. So I started buying, like, (laughs) stacks and stacks of books and then um, reading them all, all at once, you know, starting them and... Um, which is, it's, doesn't really work for me. So, um, what I've boiled it down to, well, actually I just started, uh, The Ancient Hours by Michael Bible. I don't know if you know that guy. No, I Um, don't. What's, what's his last name? Bible. Like the book. As in, as in the good book. Okay. (laughs) I don't, I've never heard of him. Yeah. What's the story? I don't know much about him. Uh, my wife got it for me for uh, Christmas, and um, I think he was like a protege of Barry Hanna, or maybe even a not a protege, but a somehow related to him. Because I think he wrote um, there was a Barry Hanna anthology that came out. 
after Barry Hanna died. Um, and I, I was looking forward to confirm this when I knew I was doing this interview, but I, I couldn't find it. But I think he wrote the intro to that anthology. Um, Barry Hanna's um, Airships is just one of the greatest short story collections I think I've ever read. Yeah, he's he's one of my favorites. Like, um, yeah, when that book that uh, it was actually at Book People that I saw the um, they have like a discount table uh, as you're waiting in line, and I, there was that. Barry Hanna anthology. Um, there was like seven of them just stacked there for like half price. And I was like, this, this is like, I was indignant. You know, I was like, this, you don't sell <laughs> books for half price. I like but bought all seven of them and just like gave them to people. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Um, There's another theory that a that a, a writer friend of mine has that when you find your book on the dollar rack, like he found one of his books on the dollar rack at the Strand in New York, uh-huh. he was really proud because he feels like then it has really entered like the the bloodstream of like book commerce somehow. Yeah, I guess it's kind of it makes it not a, a kind of a unknown or. Uh, you know, you're you're so on the radar then that people don't value you anymore. They just <laughs> right. it's like a street cred thing or something too. <laughs> yeah. But um, well, let's um, let's not stray too far from the Bible first. I, that name, first of all, is incredible. But um, Michael Michael Bible, you said. Yeah, I don't know if that's if that's even a real name, but yeah. What what do you know about it going into it? Do you know why your why your wife chose it for you? I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I I think it was because she knows I love Barry Hanna and they are somehow uh, related in a way I should have mm. investigated further, but I didn't. Um, and I just I've only read. I just started it. Um, this morning, actually, and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's about it's kind of a, it's about a well, it's about a a kid that um, I think the book came out in like just in 2020. It's about a kid that sets fire to a church, um, so it's kind of very. I mean, you know. A lot of that going on these days, but we're more shooting than fire, but it's right. Um, so I think he's trying to, yeah, come to grips with like what kind of what leads a person to do that. Mm. Um, I really liked the first page, it was very, uh, this is kind of a stream of impressionistic images that didn't really um, make a narrative or a traditional narrative. And I was hoping the whole book would be like that, but then it kind of evened out into a more uh, traditional narrative so far, but it still seems um, pretty good, you know, definitely keep reading. Do you do you like prose that feels kind of impressionistic and stream of consciousness and like that? I, I get impatient with that sometimes, and I always feel like it's kind of a failing on my part as a reader when I do. Well, like when it works, you know, it's you know, I'm open to any type of writing as as long as I'm hooked on it, you know. Um, like if the chemistry is just there somehow. Yeah, whatever it is that makes some words uh, work for the p- person reading it, you know. And yeah, I was kind of when that for that first page, I was kind of up for the challenge of like this is going to be a roller coaster, and um, you know, 
I was ready, ready for it. Ready for the ride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you abandon books often or do you tend to finish what you start in terms of books? Um, I, I've gone back and forth over the years, but now I'm in abandon, abandon mode just because I think, I mean, there, there have been a few, um, times where in books where I've stuck with it and then it's ended up blowing my mind, but Mm. that's pretty those those times are pretty rare, especially with you know the older I get and the more I've read, the more I feel like I know from just the first paragraph if if I'm hooked or not. Yeah, I think it is that chemistry thing. Uh, after you've read enough, there's sort of like an alchemical or magical thing that happens where you can know if the connection is going to be there or not. Yeah. The one book that I, well, one of my favorite books of the, that I've read in the past few years was that the George Saunders book, Lincoln and the Bardo. And mm. um, at the beginning of that, I was totally perplexed and wanting to, I did abandon it the first time after like 10 pages, like no idea what the fuck's going on. And then... <laughs> My friend uh, told me, like, just stick with it, and it gets so good. And so I, I went, I started it again, and it did, you know, after, like, I don't remember what the magic page is, but 25 or 30 pages, and it all wow. starts to click. And I've I've observed that with a couple other people that I've recommended the book to, like, they're really annoyed and kind of angry and at the first 20 pages, <laughs> but then they like, you know, once it, it clicks in, they can't stop reading it. Um, Maybe I should do it. I, you know, I'm kind of ashamed to say, but um, I read all the, early, I'm one of those guys who like, I don't know, I'm doing that thing where it's like, I like the early stuff and uh, I, I should, oh, yeah? I should know as I get older that that's kind of like, um, not always a good idea, but I loved early George Saunders. And then I sort of lost track. I don't think I stopped reading because I changed my opinion of him. It's just maybe I had had enough for the time being. So I haven't read Lincoln and the Bardo, but it's about Abe Lincoln in the afterlife, right? S- to some degree. Yeah. His son uh, is communicating with, with him, you know, his son in real life, his son died when, um, he was pretty young. I can't remember, like seven or twelve years old or something. Right. Um, yeah, I I would recommend it highly. I don't. I haven't read much. I've read a, a couple of short stories by him, so I wasn't. I, I didn't go through the same thing as you. Of it was kind of the first thing that I really read by him. I'll do it, and I'll, I'll I'll make it through to to thirty pages or so in case. Just if you know if I'm if I'm feeling the slog, I'll I'll be sure to push through. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> <laughs> his early short stories are very funny. I think there was this thing where sort of his 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 Buddhism, like he's a Buddhist in 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 his life, sort of started to come more to the fore, and maybe something about that at the time that it was happening it wasn't really where I was at as a reader. But um, yeah, it's good to go back. Yeah, I mean that can be. Like staunch Buddhists can be, uh, it's just kind of annoying when anyone thinks they, when they just pick one way to look at things, like even something as generally cool as as Buddhism. Um, like if you stick to, if you're too uh, too rigid about it, it's it's uh you know it's kind of prohibitive i think i do too yeah and i think it's good to take advantage of like in this world that we're living in now people like you and i can sort of make a, like a like a 
like it's like spirituality is like a buffet and we get to take something from here and there and not be too uh tied to one thing yeah especially buddhism buddhism <laughs> you know like <laughs> probably the true the true buddhists like uh you know they don't they aren't they aren't buddhists some of the time yeah <laughs> you know? yeah um, before we get too far away from him, I want to talk about Barry Hanna for another second because, um, you know, I think I think this is an oversight on my part again. It's like I've only I think I've only read Airships, um, which it being one of my favorite short story collections, it's odd to think that I haven't gone further. So, what else? What like what what what, what would you suggest I read next by him? Um, any of the short story collections really the that anthology which um i can't remember what it's called it's something like long lost uh forgotten or something like that and it's got a red white and blue cover that's got like that's like has is a good place to be become acquainted with him and it also has some it ends with a few stories that were never published. Um, oh, that's always fun. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much anything. I think like his last novel, which I have never read, um, Yonder Stands the Orphan, I think it's called. Um, that kind of got panned, but um, I haven't read it. But I think pretty much everything by him is... It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I have to dive back in. Do you remember how or when or where you were when you first got exposed to him? Um, I know that I it was David Berman that uh, turned me on to him uh, in the, I don't know, early 2000s maybe or... Mm. I do. I remember that David Berman was kind of like a he. He was somebody who spread the word of Hannah kind of a lot. Now that I think of it, he was a, a missionary for Barry Hannah. Well, I was wondering oh. if you feel up to the task of like um, of giving me your sort of basic, you know, um, how you see you know Barry Hannah in terms of um, tone or approach or what what kind of feeling it gives you, what kind of writer he is. All right. Um, I think that like. He, the sentences he writes are, they don't make any sense, but they make perfect sense. Um, I don't know how yeah. he even, you take one sentence and it's just, it's like this alien being that um, I don't think anyone else, I just don't even know how, how he made those sentences, but they, yeah, and still for them to be so like heavy hitting and clear, but they're um, just really strange sentences. If you stop to think about it, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's, and also you know if you have that with that type of approach, you just like you can express things that are. No one else has, um, I think, when you have a really distinct way of writing like that, that I think it's really just in the way that all people are individual beings. And then, you know, some people's writing is... I can enjoy reading something that could have been written by a hundred people, but it's also, it's a lot of fun um, to read something that could only be written by one person, you know? Yeah. To have, yeah. to have that strong of a style and voice really seems to me to um, show that, that, writer has really uh you know they've they've 
found this, their voice, you know, they mm-hmm. found the Godhead inside them that, and can write it down. What, what, it, what it's saying. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, I think that's just right. Yeah. I think that something that you were saying that kind of really makes sense to me with Barry Hanna is a lot of what he's saying is sort of, there's a, almost a surrealism to it, but he puts it in this very plain spoken kind of laconic language rather than like a Baroque kind of language. So you'd think those two things, surrealism and plain spokenness could work against each other, but with him, they work really well together. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, yeah, because I mean, normal life is pretty surreal, you know, (laughs) I'd like to go backwards a little bit if that's okay into history Um, I know these things are often wrong but your Wikipedia entry says that both of your parents were language analysts for the National Security um, agency uh-huh. is that is that true uh yeah that's yeah sort they were um they were i mean i think language analyst is the kind of um codified way of but they were like code breakers so they would listen to phone calls of uh you know, uh, terrorists, foreign, foreign terrorists. And, um, they could never tell me anything about it. So, uh, I kind of piece it together, but yeah, they would just wow. break. First they had to learn, um, different languages very fluently. And then, learn to break the codes that they were coming up with. And That's incredible. <laughs> and, and, and for, for a married couple, I mean, there's something kind of, I'm sure the work, the work on a daily basis was maybe kind of banal in a weird way, but it's, there's something sort of romantic or almost cinematic about the idea of a married, two married code breakers <laughs> to me at least. Yeah. I don't think it was, my dad did it for like 20 years before my mom, cause my mom was, you know, a, a mother and housewife. And mm, okay. so he was already doing it for like 20 years. And then she just um, thought, why not do the same thing? And I think it was, it sounds very rom- <clears throat> romantic, but it, I think it was actually a very banal and typical office job with most of their energy spent on the politics, the office politics and who was, who was getting ahead Mm. and who was not doing their work, but still getting praised because they knew how to, um, look that like they were working hard and (laughs) all that stuff. Like, I don't think it wasn't a John le Carre novel, you know, (laughs) (laughs) nothing is unfortunately. (laughs) <laughs> but um what but that does make you know knowing what they did for a living and I guess they had many languages they spoke um what sort of readers were they and what kind of like what kind of place did did books have in your home you know when you were a kid um they weren't really my dad wasn't he like never read fiction um he read some history books if he read anything, he wasn't a big reader, really. Um, and then my mom, she also, uh, not like, I mean, she liked to read, but not really voraciously. And especially in the last like 20 years of her life, for some reason, she fixated on. Uh, just the worst, like detective paperback, um, 
you know, those people that like like airport stuff. Yeah, the the writers that have a new book like every two months. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think she was. I think she wanted to escape, and that was like her very easy way to escape without even having to use her mind and yeah um yeah so they didn't i wasn't uh i wouldn't say i was encouraged to read um as a kid i was i was a tv kid <laughs> who logged you know six or seven hours of of tv every day um and didn't really wow <laughs> is that a lot <laughs> i think i mean i don't want to examine myself too much to know because it probably is normal and it just sounds like a lot but it sounds like a lot yeah especially when you're going to school what like let's not go too deep on tv but now i want to know like what 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 were these six hours what were they spent on well and this was pre cable and then also when cable came along we didn't get cable because um my my dad was super cheap and i guess couldn't imagine uh paying for television but so yeah it was just the the abysmal network tv um i would just watch any anything and everything all the terrible sitcoms and I'm not proud of it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's in there. It's in your head somewhere, though. Somehow, those kernels are informing informing you in some ways. Probably still. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Of like what Three's, <laughs> Three's Company gave me. Um, <laughs> oh, I didn't know we were talking about that level. Okay, yeah, never mind. Oh uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, well, I didn't really get into reading uh, I, probably towards the middle or end, middle of high school. Like, I actually remember my, I, I caught the end of like the last five minutes of To Kill a Mockingbird, the movie on TV late one night. Um, when I was wrapping up my my seven hours of viewing, <laughs> um, and I was so intrigued by that, it ends with the the Boo Radley character is like, if I can remember correctly, I don't, but he's like just kind of staring into the camera, and then he's running along the beach. I think, and I think that's the end. Um, mm. I was so taken with that, and this was before, like, you could, um, you know, watch something on cable the next day again, or VHS tape or anything. So I, my only choice was to get the book and yeah. and read it, and I, it was the first book that I finished, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also really liked. Um, so yeah, that that was. I feel like that was the birth of me as as a reader. I haven't read it since, but I think it was a pretty good book. <laughs> yeah, and then after that, for the rest of high school, did you did you follow your own path? You know, did you did that lead you to other books, or did you sort of how did you decide what to read next and next and next after that? Um, I think, well, for a while it was just whatever high school English, uh, whatever the teacher assigned us. And I think I've always been a slow reader, so I, I didn't really burn through books. Um, I think I was just kind of was just doing whatever the high school curriculum was like Catcher in the Rye and yeah um some other stuff and then i think it was um probably like through music like i would because the music was a much st stronger um 
and more accessible love of mine at a at the you know around the age of 14 and 15 and right i think maybe i you know i definitely got it was like the bands were recommending me books you know like listening to the fall so i would get you know albert camus the fall book yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> Stuff uh, like N- that. N- 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 nabokov he recommends nabokov to uh, ben sinister yeah i read i read some of that early for or like lolita well probably for for the obvious reasons when i was young but <laughs> <sighs> yeah it's funny when you sort of hear about books they're supposed to be sexy when you're a kid and then you go to read them and you have to wade through you know 90% of just, you know, a, a actual adult writerly musings before you get a little bit of a sex scene. Yeah. But I was I was devoted to that. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. the quest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what so what kind of a you were when you were a teenager you were you were like a punk rocker? Yeah. Um Yeah, it's definitely I grew up um outside of dc between dc and baltimore so mm. um yeah definitely like um was had my ear to the the dc hardcore scene and also just yeah punk from all over and Yeah, new wave stuff. Were, were there magazines or or, fan, or fanzines that you read a lot then that you, you know, helped you to find new things and new bands? Um, yeah, there was. Uh, I don't remember when I. Yeah, there were some local fanzines like there's one called Truly Needy that was uh, came out regularly, like. I think once a month and just kind of, you know, told me about all the shows I'd missed and because uh-huh. um, <laughs> I was too young to, to go, right. but yeah, there was another, there's a, it's kind of like one thing led to another, like, but there was a fanzine called matter that came out of somewhere in the Midwest. I think, uh Chicago maybe and I somehow stumbled on that and um and like Steve Albini was on the staff and he would write he got like the last he wrote like record reviews and but then he also got like he had kind of like this Larry King type of column on the last page <laughs> 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 where where he just got to say Whatever he wanted, you know, like oh, this recommend a uh, right celery celery soda is very refreshing, you know. Or, or All right, <laughs> like the Andy Rooney of uh of that fanzine, kind of. Yeah, but with all of his like, uh, you know, his th- the anger that he had, and also great praise for you know the music that he loved and right, right. Um, but yeah, that, that, that magazine was, um, probably, uh, turned me on to a lot of different things. Um, that reminds me, yeah. there's something, you know, it make, I guess it makes, makes, I always wondered what, what was with the faith void reference, um, on, uh, on your album, uh, sometimes I wish we were an eagle, right? It was at the end of that one, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so which which side which side are you on, faith or void? Uh, I got uh, on void, of course. <laughs> I mean, does anybody ever say faith? I love it, but you, when you're next to void, there's really nothing you can do, right? Yeah. And I actually went. Speaking of high school, and I went to high school with Bubba, the guitarist of Void. Oh wow. What what was did you know him? Were you guys friends at all? Um, we kind of. He was. I was 
super duper shy, like just barely alive, I think, like probably the shyest person that ever existed. <laughs> and uh <laughs> yeah. Bubba um was also super duper shy, at least in the um the environment of high school, which also I was different out of high school, but within the confines of those walls, like yeah. something was very repressive was going on um in, yeah. inside me. And it Bubba like was a, also um very shy and but yeah, we weren't I don't think we ever really even talked. Um, but was but, Void, Void was going on when they were still in school, right? Yeah. I mean, that was when in high school was, he was, he was already playing. Insane as that. Yeah. Right. Did you ever get to see them play? I didn't. I think they played one show. We lived in Columbia, Maryland, and I've heard the lore of, I think they only played one show there, and I somehow just didn't see the flyer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I missed it. Um, the rest of the shows were probably mostly like in DC. Yeah. Do you, as somebody who was going to become a lyricist, or maybe you already were writing at that point in, in some capacity, were you paying attention to hardcore lyrics? in terms of their writing value as well as their messages or did lyrics even matter to you at all in that, in that kind of music? Um, I always, I mean, I liked the thing about hardcore punk is the, the minimalism of it, you know, the compactness of everything, the lyrics and the, all, you know, the music, um, I was always really intrigued by how compact um, all the aspects of that music is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I appreciated it. I don't know. Sometimes it seemed a little too much. Like, stop telling me what to do, you know, and just, <laughs> right. You know, like tell tell me something else. Like, yeah. There were a lot of songs about getting um, stabbed in the back by your friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of a message, yeah. message songs in general. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most of the time, yeah, I couldn't even, it's, you know, the words are not intelligible. It's the the rage behind them that yeah. is what I was, was what I could I could connect to mostly. What did you um? What you do after high school? I I I can't remember if I've ever read if you went to college or not. Um, I tried and tried and tried. I think I dropped out three times. Um, oh. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> which uh, where a, where were you? I'm a slow I'm a slow slow learning at life's lessons. Um, <laughs> where was I? I? I was I was in Maryland, and I would just keep dropping out and. Uh, the first time I moved to Georgia for a couple of years, and that's where I started making music. But then my roommate uh, decided to go back, who I had been in college with, you know, a couple of years before. He decided to go back to school, and I decided to go back to Maryland and. 
I also decided to go back to school just because I I didn't know what else to do. And yeah, yeah. Um, so I did that and dropped out a couple more times and realized I was just wasting money and time and yeah, just decided to to make music instead, and that was. Um, you know, huge for me. Um, but I did, yeah, I started out as an English major. Um, you, and yeah, do you remember, do you remember any of your reading from back then? Um, I, I guess none of it was all that compelling if you dropped out three times. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was like T.S. Eliot, maybe it was the wasteland. Um, yeah. Um, I think, uh, mostly just stuff that didn't like Somerset mom or, oh gosh, just stuff that like didn't, yeah, didn't really, and I didn't like, I didn't like being told by the professors, uh, like what, what was, what to think about a, a novel or a poem, you know, like I, yeah, this seemed like there was almost a right and wrong way to them to, to receive the information in a book. Yeah. And now just like, that's, this is not how I read, you know? Um, yeah. Like a codified interpretation. Yeah. Like there was just a right way a right thing to get out of a book, which, yeah. So that, yeah. Yeah. Really just, I was like, fuck this. And, um, the other two times I tried different majors, but I was just totally lost as a, as a youth, you know, of that, uh, I'm so glad that I finally sacked up and dropped out for the last <laughs> time, you know, like, and I started mean, not, making music. Yeah, I mean, not everyone is uh, supposed to go to college, you know. Like it was kind of yeah. That was the late '80s. Then it was like kind of the beginning i think of that time when it was understood that everybody had to go to college if they could and whereas you know it used to be if you felt a calling to study further and yeah and then you do it or you can go learn a trade or do anything else I think we're on the other end of that lately. I mean, I don't know. I don't know too many college kids, but it seems like this is a tangent. I might not want to go down too much, but it seems like this sort of like explosion of like tech jobs and entrepreneurship um, in this weird way has kind of made college like it's cool to not go to college again now or something. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I didn't know. Like, yeah, now it's just like. I mean, it seems, I guess it's good to have a dream, but it right. seems like, um, I don't know, like you could make an app. I mean, I think for me, like I, I started in music and for years and years and years, very few people were listening and that was fine with me. Um, I think with if you're trying to do an app, you need, you have to kind of have a big success for it to. I'm trying to like correlate the, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough correlation to make, but I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think with an app, you make you try to. I that's a mindset that I have trouble even imagining myself inside of. But yeah. I guess you like make one. If it doesn't take off, you kill it and make something totally new. It's not like iterate in the same way that no that doesn't make sense either i mean songwriting you know maybe you can tell me but like 
you, you, it's like, is it like an accumulation of experience and, and, you know, failing and trying that makes you learn how you're going to do it, right? You have to write a bunch of stuff that you're not quite in love with and build, but you also have to put out the stuff that you're not in love with to be an active part of that world. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the, you got to have that feedback. Right, right. Georgia's where, what took you to Georgia when you were out of high school? Why, why'd, you, why'd you move there? And was it Atlanta? Um, it was outside Atlanta. It was just because I'd made a friend in, in school in Maryland, and then his parents moved. When we dropped out, his parents moved to Georgia, and then he was like my best friend, and uh, he went down there, and it was time of, there was like a, it was a boom town then, and you could get paid pretty well just to do work in the service industry, and you could get a, a nice apartment for fairly cheap, so he got me a job in the grocery store he was working in and he um, said I could rent a room in the apartment he was sharing with some people. So basically he just like made it so easy. All I had to do was get down there and I had a job and a place to live. So um, that's why I kind of randomly ended up down there. How do you remember that as a good time in your life now when you look back at it? It was a great time, I think. I worked the graveyard shift and, um, you know, like midnight till seven. And when you're 22 or however old I was then, you know, I could stay up all night and then stay up all day. I can't do that anymore, but it was like nothing. So it was like basically having... We would work all night and then go down to Atlanta and, you know, just explore bookstores and record stores and restaurants and and go to show at night and then like come back in time for work and <laughs> um, it was it was fun. <laughs> it sounds yeah. exhausting. Yeah, looking back on it now, it's kind of that's definitely a twenty and young twenties kind of pace. Yeah. <laughs> but you said that that's um that's where you that's where you started making music of your own. Yeah, I got a four track and well me and the guy were we were me and my friend were going to we tried to start a band together but it didn't go anywhere and so I ended up just um doing it myself. Um, and then I continued. Once I moved back to Maryland, I, 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 I continued. Well, I think that time was super important to me of my um, early 20s. That's like, I think when I really started to, when I was reading like, Kafka and Dostoevsky, uh, like those, those two writers were huge. Like, you know, for what to kill a mockingbird, like, um, kind of opened me up to, it was nothing compared to, um, the Kafka and Dostoevsky, like basically, um, reading my mind, you know, that feeling of... Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I, well, as a, especially as a young person, you think, I, I could have written this, you know, if I just had sat down and, you know, right. that's totally not <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. But that feeling of, oh God, like somebody, you know, I have a, a kin here who... um really gets me or is me in, in some ways. And so, yeah. And yeah. 
that was in my early 20s and that was i mean definitely like helped me mm, yeah even just help me write songs i think like um i feel like my my first record at least was kafkaesque <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think that's true, uh, thinking uh, back to listening to it, yeah. <laughs> just like, yeah, a trapped, a person that's just trapped in, trapped in a four, a four foot by four foot room or something. Right. <laughs> Horrified <laughs> by, by, by life and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, being sort of, like, baffled and, and horrified by, like, institutions and society and things like that. Absurdity. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite, uh, Dostoevsky? I mean, I haven't even read the the book that... I haven't read a, a, all of his stuff. So. <laughs> I've never actually read Dostoevsky, but I've heard he's cool. So. <laughs> that I definitely locked on to. I thought him. I'd bring him up. um well what do you what what did you read what did you read by him what what have you read by dostoevsky no i'm just kidding but like what (laughs) what what did you really what did you really like by him when you read it (laughs) it was uh crime and punishment and then uh brothers karamazov or however you say it Yeah. yeah um crime and punishment i think like just for the like acknowledgement that we're all everyone is evil you know and that was kind of yeah good good to good to hear somebody say that um and probably later gave birth to a song like ex-con i think um and then brothers Karamazov, um, yeah, just because of the like astoundingly deep character studies and like the inter the psychological relationships between the fathers and brothers, and I always, I, I mean, I think parents are are there for our study kind of like as a kid parents are kind of they are just in a it's a lab experiment you know you're just like uh, i've always studied my parents and I, I think everybody does or most people do and um so i think that's the reason why a book so much about family uh, interaction as the way that Dostoevsky wrote about it was was uh, validating and for me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think a lot about. I tend to be a very. I'm not a nostalgic person, and I'm also. I'm a kind of a. I burn my bridges when it comes to for lack of a better word, for books and music, like I find that, especially stuff that I liked at a young age, um, you know, you go back to it and it doesn't, you know, I tried to read a Kafka book like five or eight years ago and I just was not interested and um, yeah. I've tried to read there's unread Dostoevsky that I really feel like I should read but um, it just doesn't at least not the times I've tried since then it just hasn't really spoken to me it just feels like such a maybe because it's so attached to that part of my life that you right. know, I've changed and maybe it can't 
it can't speak to me anymore because it's kind of tied up in that that era of my existence. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's something to you having used what you learned from those books. And I don't mean learned like you learned your ABCs. I mean like le- learned on a more like elemental level. But like what you learned from those books, taking it and putting it into your own work. I wonder if like that extra step of having done that as opposed to most readers who don't do that. Maybe that really made those books like uh, redundant to you in a way or something. Yeah, like I've they've been enacted or something. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a better word for it. Yeah. 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 Which I mean, I think that's what people who create things do. The kind of they take something and they. Uh, put it in the wood chipper and spit it out as something else, you know. And um, yeah, definitely. Um, it definitely could be could be why I don't know. Do you? You know, it seems like something that is so um such a touchstone for your development uh should remain that way but i don't do like the books that you were reading when you're early 20s are that do you do you still hold them up as your something you could read now i I don't, not all of them for sure. I mean, when you were talking about not going back to Dostoevsky and Kafka, I immediately thought of Henry Miller for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, he's definitely. I loved him in my. Yeah. He's like a teenage. Yeah, because I did did actually, yeah, I read uh, a couple of his books when I was like 16 or 17. And yeah. Yeah, just. It's like he's talking about urinating, and it's like it's it's so exciting because he's talking about urinating and against a brick yes, wall or something. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Or like a woman, like you know, the kind of like sexual detail he go. That's kind of like what we were talking about earlier. It's like you pick up these books when you're young because they're supposed to have sex in them, and it's like there is some sex. There's a lot of sex in Henry Miller, but there's also a lot of just like looking at a piece of bread and musing about it for like thirty pages too. Or like these extended um, nostalgic backgrounds to like his, uh, you know, growing up in Brooklyn or something like that. So like the sex scenes with Anais Nin are very few and far between, really, in the in the greater body of work. <laughs> yeah, I'm remembering now. Like, yeah, in our in our house growing up, you know, there was we had the poor noise complaint, um, right which has the famous, a few famous sex scenes. And I think we, we also had uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, which was, uh-huh. it was harder to find the sex scenes in that, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's one that I never tried. I never tried Lady Chatterley's Lover. Lady, Lady Chatterley's Lover. I did read, I read Portnoy's Complaint when I was far too young to even appreciate it. And I don't know if I would even like Philip Roth. Now I've tried him. I've, that's a guy that I've tried a few times in my life, and I haven't really clicked with anything of his yet. But maybe one day. Yeah, I had. Oh, this is actually a, his book, "The Letting Go." I think is that what it's called, "Letting Go." I don't know that. I think it's his first novel, and um, I loved that. Um. And I remember Berman, I talked to David Berman about, he was also a fan of that. Um, But then other things, I tried to read stuff recently. There was one book um, that gave me such a disgusting feeling inside, and I just (laughs) hated it. Um, But I don't know if it was kind of, I don't remember which which one, but it's about um, a guy, a father has 
think he's got like a 16 year old daughter and she runs away and is like homeless and oh. um, there's something like about the way the book was written that just made me feel really like dirty inside and I didn't yeah. like it. Um, Do you think that's, was that what he wanted the reader to feel or was it, was, was he like reveling in, in, in this, the stuff? I think was he was, I think his... he was reveling in it. I think. Uh-huh. That's, and, yeah, that's not good. What's the letting go about? Um, well, I read it like 30 years ago, but I think it's about a young married couple, um, or maybe two married couples and just, yeah, it's just about being married and, um, fighting with your spouse and not wanting to be married and then wanting to be married and wanting to have, right. To sleep with someone else and all that stuff that seemed to be very, uh, 70s 80s novel 70s novels i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the suburban marriage was kind of fluid in the 70s it seems especially fluid maybe yeah like who's that guy who's written like 5000 short stories about <laughs> going to um, parties and uh, updike no the not that guy because he writes um, a lot about horny married people, too. Yeah. He's another guy that really, like, came to disgust me. Like, at first, I liked the first book I read by him, which I think was Rabbit Run, and then the sequels, like, I got that similar, like, disgusted feeling inside from the same as the Philip Roth yeah. Yeah. You get this feeling sometimes with Cheever. I mean, not with Cheever, with Updike. Although with Cheever, too, Cheever's, a little bit. That he's, Cheever, that's it. Cheever's who you're thinking of? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, we yeah, accidentally yeah. got it then. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with both of those guys, and Philip Roth, I guess, too, there's this feeling sometimes that they're getting a little too horny while they're writing this stuff. And it feels, <laughs> maybe that's the grossness that you feel when you read it. Yeah. It's like... yeah. Yeah, it's like when you're looking at a, a some like a cartoonist book or something, and you you wonder if they ever draw the characters fucking, and they probably do. They're not in the book, <laughs> like right, like the Peanuts <laughs> or something, or like Gar- Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I couldn't help but be struck when you were talking about um, going back to Dostoevsky and Kafka and finding that they, you maybe their utility had been, you know, you, you, you'd you use them in the way you needed to use them or something. I know I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit there. But I think about those writers in relation to um, these lyrics in this song of yours, 35, you know, on your on your last album. And I, I know that you work inside characters, you know, a lot in your lyrics, but I was wondering when you say that, you know, I can't see myself in the books uh, I read these days. Mm-hmm. Is, 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 that, is that a personal um, observation in that song? Um, yeah, it was. I mean, uh, I think once uh, reading really caught fire for me in the, in my early 20s and then it was giving me so many uh, life lessons and reassurances and um, mind expanding uh, way different ways of looking at things and all that stuff um, but then at a point a certain point I think Ten, ten years later, <clears throat> it kind of dried up, you know, the stream of 
the classics mm. that I must read, you know, seem to I've read all that were appealing to me and um yeah, so for, for a while I thought I was I was done with books, but just kept searching and searching, trying things um, until I, you know, luckily found that there are more books that I'm going to love out there that I will have ever have time to read in my life. You know, I just got to... Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think those old books are like that you read are like almost like getting a lesson or something and you don't need to go back and learn that lesson again, I guess. Yeah, um, I think that's true. And as you came out of that period, do you remember any of the books or writers that, that like renewed your ability to, or enjoyment in reading? Um, I remember I discovered, um, James Kelman, the Scottish writer that no one really seems, he's not very well known, but. Yeah, I don't know him. Yeah, he, um, yeah, just amazing to me. Like his, his first big book, his first book was, I think it was his, no, it wasn't his first one, but his first big book was How Late It Was, How Late. Um, I think it won some prizes and so it got some attention and that's how I heard about him and then went, you know, just read everything that he's written and um, that is a real, he has different writing styles, like he kind of changes it up, which is something I like about him. He, um, the early books were a very much especially how late it was how late um it was very inner monologue just kind of unfiltered as if the brain is the way that you know this the narration that we all have in our heads from our brain like he had somehow right got that down um and not you know not a lot happens quote unquote in the stories um but a lot does you know just um yeah that i mean he's definitely someone who reaffirmed my my faith in in reading is that the book to start with how late it was how late if i'm gonna read him i would well i would maybe start with there's a he has an anthology of short stories called Busted Scotch that I think might be a good place to start. Okay. I like that title. Yeah. That'll give you like a, a sampling of his different writing styles. And yeah, he's really like no one seems to know about him. I wrote him a fan letter like in the early 2000s. I say everything in the past is early 2000s because I can't remember dates, but <laughs> that works. <laughs> um, yeah, just knowing that he wasn't, didn't seem to be very recognized. And um, yeah, we ended up meeting. Uh, the next time I was in Scotland and we had some drinks together and I stayed in touch with him. We met, I think he came to a couple of my shows and um, yeah, he definitely, well, you never know if someone's going to like something, but I, you should definitely at least give him, give it a try. I will. Cause I think he needs to be better. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's one of the main reasons I even, I want to do this podcast is, is things like this. I'm hearing about somebody that I've never heard of, you know, it's great. Um, did you guys like strike up a correspondence? Did you become letter, letter writing friends? 
Um, we did. Um, it's kind of fallen by the wayside, but um, yeah, at first he, yeah, he, he, we would, he would send me his new books and I would send him my records and mm. um, he made a Cajun mixtape for me once. And <laughs> A Scottish man made you a Cajun mixtape? Yeah, well actually he, he lived in Austin before I did for a couple of years before I met him and uh he's very well versed in uh yeah he loves blaze foley and i quoted him in his books and stuff do you remember how you found him james kelman yeah i asked my friend um colin gagan who he's he's played some done some touring with me and also with will oldham um and it's just an old friend um i asked him i was like i want to read something really harsh what hmm. can you recommend me and he he recommended that how late it was how late um and yeah it is a very harsh yeah i don't know what why i was i guess i mean like kind of raw and like not with any like you know, no cushioning or of of the language. I just wanted something that was just kind of a, a pouring out of what it really is to to be alive. You know, um, I mean, I've never, I've never really been been one for like flowery or long winded novels. Um, you know, I like it. Most of the time I like, like just get to the, get to the heart of the matter, you know? Yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm all for, um, language. that's a little more plain and unadorned because you can still, you can be quite poetic with plain language as you know, in your lyrics. Yeah. It's just, that's the most electric kind of feeling for me. Um, some people like to read five pages about um, a blooming flower or something, but <laughs> <laughs> well, that that actually reminds me. I wanted to ask you about poetry, <laughs> which is all about blooming flowers, right? But <laughs> are you? Um, how do you feel about poetry? Um, it was basically. I was not a poetry reader for my whole life until about mm, people would always ask me about it because I wrote songs like, Oh, what poets do you like? And I was yeah. always just like, I hate poetry. <laughs> um, <laughs> then, yeah, then I discovered this guy, Frank Stanford. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know him? Yeah, yeah, he's great. The moon is, yeah. um, what's the, the moon, yeah. the moon title? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Battleground where the moon says I love you or something like that. Um, yeah, he's great. What, 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 what did you find in him that, that, that was different for you? Um, just, the, I think it was kind of like Barry Hannah. It's like, like, what the hell are you doing here? And why does it make sense? so much sense why does it hit me so hard when it's doesn't it shouldn't from when i like break down your your sentences like why is this like giving me boost goosebumps you know like yeah uh just and i don't even know like how, how he's doing that but um yeah that was and also maybe actually before that emily dickinson i kind of like i'd always been intrigued by her um but uh didn't really explore her until her her 
her work until um, maybe eight years ago or something. Um, she's really she cool. Is, yeah. Well, she's, that's something that's kind of been, um, I asked my friend, because uh, I felt like Emily Dickinson was, she almost, she seems like an alien, her or like her brain must be as like big as my house. Like the things she says are just they're out of this world, I think. And Yeah. Um I think I asked my friend who is very knowledgeable poetry person and you know, if they thought that she was an alien. <laughs> and uh <laughs> she was like, No, I think she was abused and that kind of really totally shattered my way of reading her and I kind of couldn't didn't want to read it anymore um well yeah just to think of like how this amazing brain was like was born out of abuse you know if, if that's true and it probably i mean i know people don't really know much about her life but it seems to make sense like uh yeah yeah i mean we know that it was a very cloistered life and it's supposed to have been pretty traumatic too um and that definitely will add a new a new level to the poetry when you read it it's it's always been interesting to me, yeah, how much somebody who did live um, in some ways like a limited life, you know, geographically and experience wise, could um, could be so wise. Yeah, I think she m- might have been like physically or sexually abused by somebody, and that kind of the only way that she could. Um, deal with that is by giving voice to her like shattered or um, you know very precise perceptions that uh, yeah that's so I haven't I haven't it's been uh, hard to go back and read it now just because I all I can see now is the pain. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there's still the wonder and the, but everything's infused with pain. Yeah, like a uh, the empathy is is, is almost uh, like overwhelming or something like. That. Just knowing like how she got that voice, you know, I, I would prefer to right. think that she came from another planet, but I don't think she did. <laughs> And thus ends part one. Here comes part two, which we recorded maybe a week later, and which, as I've warned you, has sound quality that is somewhat diminished compared to what you just heard. Please bear with us. I noticed in another interview with you online somewhere that you um, you recommended reading Studs Terkel, and I love him, and he hasn't come up yet on this podcast. So if you feel up to it, can you tell me a little bit about what you like about him and your favorite books and... Studs whole yeah, deal. Um, it's kind of like I I always I guess I've I've always enjoyed um, like people speaking here, listening to people talk. I like like loved talk radio since I was um, you know like eight or nine years old, and um, I think his books. That's basically what his books are, are just people talking. Um, um, I think just... Yeah, oral history. Yeah, I mean, I think human speech is like is the highest art form we have, even though we don't really consider 
could consider it an art. Um, like just regular conversation to me is, is, is the original, uh, art. And, um, I always find reading his stuff, uh, really inspires me to make songs too. There's just something about, I think I, I think of the songs that I write are, they are supposed to kind of, well, because I have to sing them, I have, I consider them the need to be like conversational or, um, a monologue or something like that. And I think just reading the, the, the rhythms and the patterns of people's speech, which you can find in the Studs Terkel's books, um, that really is like the pulse of, of creation for me. Um, it's so hard to replicate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Probably impossible. You can't beat the real, the window to people's worlds, you know, like all those, the struggles people have, you know, in the, the books about, you know, the book about, um, racism, that one, I was looking at that the other day, you know, it's from 30 years ago, but it could be from today, you know, nothing has changed. And, you know, you can look at things from a political perspective. Yeah. Um, but we all know politics is complete bullshit. I mean, you know, that's, that's been drilled into our heads in the last, Yeah. but look at what the people are saying. And it's like, you know, it's a human perspective and it's uh, that just hasn't changed. You know? and His book about the great depression, um, I think is like, is the defining history of, of the great depression. And I haven't looked at it for a few years, but I have a feeling that just like his racism book, a lot of what's going on now would ring uncomfortably true to what went on then in that book. Yeah. Um, what is that one called? I might have actually read that. <laughs> uh, hard times. Are, are there any, um, you know, I'm trying to think of like contemporary, you know, practitioners of the oral history. And it seems like the only ones I can think of are like histories of bands or art movements. Or so it seems like these more ambitious oral histories, like I, I haven't seen one for a while. They're more just about cultural things now. Can you think of any? Any that are just about what contemporary times? Yeah. Well, or about like a broad, like I'm thinking there's another, um, there's this writer, Mark Baker, who used to do these oral histories, um, that were about really broad things. Like he did one called cops. That's just, um, it's from the eighties and it's just cops telling their stories, um, you know, good, bad and, and, and everything in between. And he did one called Nam, which is like a, one of the greater histories of the Vietnam War, too. And it's all just, you know, the voices of the people who were there. There's also a story, maybe apocryphal, that it's where in Mackay got the word uh, Fugazi. I'm sure there's a reason why, you know, Studs Terkel books were embraced and necessary at the time. And now they've, you know, with the advent of everything radio and uh, podcasts and stuff like maybe they're just um, people are getting that from elsewhere but yeah it's a shame there is a book I love uh, that just popped into my head but um, I can't remember what it's called but it's um, and I, I just love this format of it's this guy goes back and talks to a bunch of um, boxers at the end of their career, um, you know, when they're all retired and most of them 
died like a year or two after talking to him, but he just took a photo of each of them now, or, you know, at the time of the interview and also included a photo of when they were young. Um, and then they just got to tell their story mm. from beginning to end. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really great book. That does sound great. If you remember the title, yeah, maybe let me know if you remember the title. Are you the kind of person who keeps every book that you read? Like, is your house stacked full of books, or, or do you tend to, like, give them away or give them to the library or sell them or otherwise pass them um, on? I, I really like to to share books, um, especially because re- re- rereading is so, such a rare act. Um and rebuying is such a, a beautiful feeling uh, act, you know. Just because you're, you know, you're supporting a, a writer and a publishing company, like um, more than once, you know. <laughs> right, right. So, but yeah, I keep. I, I think I keep everything. I, I've gone through. I sometimes I purge and sell a bunch of things, but I prefer to to give them away or keep them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) One or the other. Are there any, are there any special copies of books that have a cement sentimental value to you? Like as objects that you've had in your life for a while or even gotten recently? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not a sentimental. Well, I am a sentimental guy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was, yeah, like I, the way that I developed as a human was in getting rid of things and not having anything. And that's like my foundational way of being, you know, um, just so I could. Uh, get the hell out of Dodge whenever I needed to or wanted to and that kind of yeah not keeping anything but then yeah I can't think of like a book really like I mean I think that the 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 weight and the importance of a book is not really in the copy that I have you know that the fact that it exists and yeah um, yeah i don't really have i only have that much that kind of attachment i don't think to I mean, nothing's coming to mind i i um i envy that i'm surrounded by books and i'm finding myself having to move in the next few months and it's it's like it's terrifying how much just sheer tonnage i have to yeah well i mean i have good memories of you know sometimes someone gives me a book and that book, you know, the physical copy of that book helps me or keeps me tied to that memory. Yeah. But you have to... That's kind of what I meant. Yeah. Well, can't you just bring them with you? <laughs> <laughs> I can, yeah. But I have, I've become like a book collector and seller, so I have to decide which... Um, you know, there are a lot of books that don't have any any sentimental value to me here now is what I'm saying. The ones that mean something to me, yeah, I could carry those in one milk crate, probably. Get a milk crate. (laughs) (laughs) Are there particular books about music or biographies of musicians that you've liked? Um... Pretty much any book about that topic, I, I can enjoy it. I think just because it's my field, you know, and it's, um, you know, you can just relate to whether someone is, you know, selling five records or five million, you know, the, what they go through is, 
somewhat the same. There's a lot of similarities. So, um, but I tend to not like let myself have that pleasure. I think I, there's that phrase guilty pleasure, which I've never understood um, what that means. But I think maybe like books about music are, are my guilty pleasure because I think they're all too easy, like uh, for me to enjoy. <laughs> um, and that's like, yeah, but I, um, like the Tom T hall, I don't know if you've read this. Tom T hall has a couple, well, he's got a memoir called, Storytellers, Nashville. Yeah, he wrote some books about how to write songs, which I haven't read, and obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then Storytellers, Nashville is uh, just about him coming up and like just drinking beer at, um, you know, what was that play? Tootsie's bar that all the songwriters went in Nashville and and the pills like everyone trying to get pills and I just I like the it's like a he just kind of goes like his daily life of just waking up and trying to write songs and deciding to drink beer instead and um <laughs> Um, yeah, that's. And then I read that the George Clinton autobiography um, came out like maybe eight years ago or something like that. I didn't know there was a George Clinton autobio. Wow. What was that like? Yeah. Well, see, I thought it was going to be crazy because <laughs> <laughs> the music is so crazy, but um, his autobiography is really matter of fact. And he just talks about his daily, you know, how he tried to make it like he read billboard every week or how often it came out. I think it's a weekly and tried to figure out what people were doing and, um, to promote themselves. And, wow. um, he talks a little bit about, drug usage, but not nearly as much as I was hoping. <laughs> and, it's, and it's in a very kind of matter of fact way, just like, you know, as it's part of, part of, uh, his career kind of, or his creative process. Um, like fuel. Yeah. Just like, like a, a, on a checklist, you know, it's like a, Tune my guitar, check, you know, drop acid, check, you know, free billboard and check. Um, <laughs> so, but even that is like, I still ate it up. It's very, it's kind of a dry, matter of fact, telling of, um, you know, his music's trajectory, but, even that, you know, it's, uh, I, uh, I enjoy it. <laughs> Going back to that Tom T. Hall book about how to write a song, do you think, is it possible to learn how to write a song from a book? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if that's the way you want to do it, I, I, if you need that, uh, if you need that, I guess. I, don't I mean, it's kind of like those you know, all those screenwriting book or how to write a novel books. Like I was, there are so many of those. Yeah, I mean, I've never read one, but they always seem like total bullshit. I think they are something written by someone who can't write a novel. 
I mean, I've looked at a few of them just in moments of desperation as a writer, and they all tend to break things down in like sort of a mathematical way. Like, you know, by this page, you must have had this happen, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like no fun, no, no adventure. Yeah. <laughs> but thinking about like knowing or learning how to write a song, do you, was there a time for you did you feel like you knew how to write a song right away? Or was there a time when after a certain amount of years or records, you said to yourself or you were able to think, I, I, I know this now, you know, this is really something I've, I've figured out or have you figured it out yet? No, I, I haven't. And I, um, you know, I know that I never will. You know, I was, I was working on some songs or a song before, before you called me today and um, it's a very lost in the jungle feeling you know it's there's no there's no maps um, and it's good you know you just have to hack your way out and it'll starve they'll starve you you'll starve in there <laughs> <laughs> if uh, you don't get out um, it can you know um, and then also when I started, I what what I did because I couldn't write a song was I I changed the rules, you know, like there's no verse, chorus, chorus and bridge and all that. It's just like I'm gonna play one string on my guitar and the song is gonna be um, eight words long and then a horrible screeching sound is going to come in and end it all. (laughs) (laughs) And then, you know, it's just like you do, you do what you can, you know? Yeah. That was the early template. Yeah. You just do what you can. Maybe if it's the kind of thing where if you actually feel like you figured it out, then you're screwed. Maybe it's that pursuit of, figuring it out and knowing that you never will, that, that makes you able to write songs. It might be that's that way with, with a lot of art. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the same as like, uh, you know, believing in God, you know, any, if you're certain about, you can't be too certain about it. What is the Johnny Cash quote where, uh, you know what I'm talking about? I can't remember. Something like No. Don't trust the man who says he's found God. Mm. But trust the one who says he's still looking or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I mean I by by having made records for twenty five years, um I definitely see, I guess the, the, the thing that I've, the most important thing I've learned is that, um, something will come eventually and it's never easy. It's always just kind of the same quicksand mess, you know, that you're drowning in until you, you're finally not. And then, yeah it's yeah I don't know I mean some people probably a a formula works for some people I imagine people who if you can you know I can't read music or, or anything so maybe maybe if you're approaching things from that kind of um in that way uh, maybe there is a form, formula that works. Yeah. I think it'll just get you a very different kind of song than your process will get you. Yeah. But I wonder about, like, I mean, writing a novel seems like a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've tried and continue to try, and it is. But I think just like songwriting, there's like a, there's like a brill building kind of way to write a novel too, which is just to assemble it based on 
a certain kind of outline that you can learn by like, I don't know, watching a master class with somebody like James Patterson, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I wonder, I don't really know, like, um, do you think most people follow the, a structure like that or just like hammer it out and then try to piece together a structure or not? I think it depends on the kind of book, you know, I think that, I think that, um, you know, mainstream thrillers, which I like a lot of, probably most writers who do those do work that way. But most of the writers who I really feel like a more, um, you know, deeper connection with, I think they probably follow your method. They get into the, into the bush and then have to get out. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I have friends who are writers. Um, and sometimes they'll say something like, they'll be talking about something they've read and this and they'll talk about how you know like i like to see how this writer did this and they can like quote unquote see what they're doing um which i never to me when i read i'm kind of in a a trance you know and uh I can't see what anyone's doing. I know that it's having an effect on me and connecting with me and, um, but the mechanics of it. Yeah. I I, I can't see that. I don't want to see them. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I, I don't think I want to either. I think it may be that's, you have to go back and read it. I mean, yeah, the ideal reading feeling is, is to be lost in it. Right. I think. Yeah, but this you know, this reminds me. Um, in the first issue of my magazine, I published a piece of short fiction by you. So you have done this kind of. And you wrote you wrote this you know epistolary novel. Do you have any other projects like that that you've been working on or that you think about doing? You know, in terms of writing um, fiction in in one form or another. Um, I I mean I really enjoyed writing my epistolary novelette. Um, I've just been kind of, I guess I, I work best on those things when someone asks me to do it or, Mm. um, like you, I, you, for some reason (laughs) asked me to write a short story. And so I, I tried for you because you asked, (laughs) (laughs) It, it wasn't like something that I, I, have, I don't think I've even tried since then. That was right. 10 years ago. 2013, I think. I didn't know that because it felt it felt to me like such a well-formed thing. And I asked you because, you know, I think your stories are often, your songs are often stories. So I thought maybe you would want to do that as well. But it felt like there was something you had, like that you had already worked on. And it was like, so that's, I didn't know that. That's surprising to hear. Yeah. I mean, I would like to do more. I just, I need a good idea. Write another one for me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know, you've been doing this great project with Will Oldham um, over the course of the pandemic where you guys are recording all kinds of um, unexpected covers in unexpected ways. Um, And I, I know Will to be such a great sharer of books. Um, I was wondering if you guys have passed any books or recommendations back and forth while you've been talking about this or at any point in your friendship. Um, I remember actually he turned me on to James Salter. Mm. Um, he gave me that solo faces book, um, about the climbing rock climbing. (laughs) Um, that was, yeah, when I lived in Sacramento. So that was early, I don't know, late 90s, I think. Um, so that was, yeah, very valuable. 
like I went on to read a lot of um, Salter's books and really, really loved them. He's great. Uh, yeah. But also I was thinking about, I, I guess I always, I don't know why I think of um, Richard Yates. Oh, sure. Richard Yates. Yeah. yeah. Do you, have you, you've read some of his work? Yeah. I mean, I've read I think, everything. I think he's great. Do you have a favorite? Um, I don't remember what it's called, but it's the novel about, uh, it's a, about a mother and son relationship. And I think maybe she was a painter when she was young and then Mm -hmm. in her old age, I think she decides to pick it up again, if I remember correctly. And it's just, yeah. And he's a, he's a struggling writer, I think. And yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what that one's called. I can't remember either. I've read them all too. He's, he wrote so much from his life. You know, his mother was a frustrated sculptor who went in and out of doing it. And, um, and he was kind of ashamed of her in, in, in all these sort of odd ways. Yeah, I can't remember the t- what that one was. I really love the Easter Parade, the one about the two sisters. Yeah. Well, no, I was just thinking about, they always call, there's like a, they call Salter, they call him the master of the American sentence, I think. <laughs> and I guess I think about, the thing that blows me away about, uh, Richard Yates is um, how he can, when he introduces a new character and it's like one, the first sentence about them and it's like a whole, there's a whole Henry James novel in that one sentence. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I don't, that is just amazing. Yeah. (laughs) He's a master of the opening line too. Yeah. Um, you know, now that you've, you're a father, I'm wondering, you know, you've kind of become exposed probably to the world of children's books, again, since the time when you were a child. And have you found any that you particularly like, or have you noticed trends in children's books that you do or don't like? Well, the worst thing in the world is, like, when your kid gets attached to a really stupid or annoying book <laughs> and you have to read it to them over and over. Uh-huh. Um, mostly, I mean, I think TV is really a kid's TV these days, you know, is there's literally thousands of shows they can watch and it's, um, you know, pretty stiff competition for, to get a kid to stop watching TV and to read books which I think is how we started this interview, but <laughs> about me, but <laughs> right. That's right. You told me about your six, six to eight hours a day of TV when you were a kid. But there, yeah, I, mean, I didn't really have, there was those, the only book I think that I wanted to recheck out with my son from my youth was <clears throat> those, they're called ant and B. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I know those. Uh, I just, the drawings are very kind of stuck in my head um, my whole life. And yeah. so I got, I got some of those for him and you know, they're all right. Not, <laughs> not as good as you remember. I mean, they're kind of weird and just, yeah, just the drawings are kind of, kind of stick in your head a little bit, but, um, I've mostly used it as a way to, there's some amazing illustrators, you know, that are involved in kids' books. And I bought a bunch of the um, William Steig or Stieg. He did, well, he actually, he wrote Shrek. Uh, that was his big, um, but he, he writes very, like, psychedelic uh 
books about this one called the toy brother who a, a kid shrink like experiments with his father's uh, chemistry lab and makes his brother drink it and <laughs> shrinks him, makes him into a little toy. And, and there's another one, Sylvester and the magic pebble, but <clears throat> um, a donkey uh, finds a magic pebble and that gives him, grants him wishes, but it turned him into a stone and he stayed. Wow. Yeah. It's, they sound sort of terrifying. Yeah, he was like a stone for four seasons. You know, and they show the snow coming down on him and the sun beating down on him. And his parents are look for him for a year. And after a year, they give up and they, they've been mourning in their house and they decided, okay, we're going to, it's time to go out and, you know, start our lives again. And so they go have a picnic and they sit on this big rock that turns out to be their baby donkey boy. (laughs) And we come to the end. Thanks again to Bill for being so generous with his time and his conversation. Uh, Soon after our second session, he wrote me with a few follow-up thoughts. Uh, Bill writes, Just for closure, things I could have mentioned, I've been reading that illustrated version of Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens, to my five-year-old. He's surprisingly into it, but it's pretty heavy, the war of the various human species that led to only sapiens surviving. Another important recent book for me is Chris Arnades, and this is Jesse, I don't know if I'm um, pronouncing that last name correctly. It's A-R-N-A-D-E-S. Chris Arnade's Dignity. The Wall, Street gu- the Wall Street guy who quit Wall Street and went to the street just to find out how the poor live. Uh, it changed my view on McDonald's and churches, the places of worship, not the chicken joint. <laughs> uh, maybe he's kind of a successor to Turkle. And the boxing book is In This Corner by Peter Heller. Another good boxing book is Facing Ali. Ali's opponents talk about fighting him. Oh, and I wanted to ask you, this is still Bill writing an email, by the way. Oh, and I wanted to ask you, um, one of your potential questions for me, books that made you laugh or cry, do you have any? I feel like books, in quotes, should be somewhere in between laughter and tears. If I'm laughing or crying, and I'm a big crier, almost every movie I've ever seen makes me messed up with joy or pain or revelation. If I'm laughing or crying with a book, it's almost transgressive or a betrayal. Um, okay, this is me, Jesse, returning to you now. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it that Bill points out there. Um, I thought about it, and maybe the experience of watching a movie is more passive and sort of takes you over, while with a book you need to kind of stay in it a little more. Like, even if you are being transported by a book, you're still doing a kind of work as you read that's different from the work you do watching a movie. I know, it's something to think about, something to consider. Thanks for that, Bill. Um, and to answer his question, and I, th- I thought of three books off the bat that made me cry. Uh, Dennis Johnson's Already Dead, the ending of it. Dennis Johnson's Tree of Smoke, the ending of it. And Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace, the ending. I feel like I might have mentioned all this on the podcast previously, and sometimes I worry that I'll start to repeat myself a little on here between all the interviews. Like, I'll share the same anecdote or observation twice. If you hear me doing that, just know that it's because um, I really believe in whatever I'm saying. I don't know. But also, I'll take that as a good catalyst to read more so that I'll have more to say. This episode was recorded by me uh, from my home in Mount Washington, Los Angeles, speaking to Bill uh, at his home in Austin, Texas. It was... um, Produced and edited, well, no, it was edited by Justin Geller. I don't think anybody really produced this, but edited and cleaned up by Justin Geller and facilitated by Lars Kreslins. Uh, the music is all Bach, performed and arranged by Cyrus Garmani. Uh, you can find more apology stuff at apologymagazine.com, which I think 
by the time this episode is released or soon after that, we'll have um, finally have a, a, an overhaul released. So the site will have a bunch of new content, including stuff from the um, out of uh, stock first issue and some new shirts and stuff to buy. So please go and check it out. Apologymagazine.com. Um, it would be great if you could review, um, subscribe and do whatever else you're supposed to do to show that you like this podcast on the various platforms that it exists on. Uh, and yeah, please feel free to write me at hello at apologymagazine.com with um, comments and criticism and ideas for guests or books to read, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. <laughs>